you know, the pandemic has this interesting effect where um, it has shifted household budgets around, it's changed lifestyles and suddenly surgical considerations that were backburnered are being frontburnered. And I know you've seen that in your practice, but um, you know, we see it too. And the good news is we see going forward, you know, we're sort of a leading indicator of where the industry is going. Mm-hmm. And it, it speaks well to many areas, not all, but most that surgeons, particularly your peers really care about. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Technology of Beauty, where we cover all things in the beauty business, and we talk to the movers and the shakers, such as our guest today, Mr. Tom Seary, who is the founder and the CEO of Real Self. Welcome, Tom. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. Awesome to be on your show, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Same here. This is my first uh, Zoom podcast uh, and Tom is actually in Seattle, and I'm here in, in our recording studio in Manhattan Beach. So uh, give me a little hall pass on this first Zoom podcast. I also want to let all of you know that there's going to be a breaking hot announcement at the end of this podcast. So stick with us to the end, and you're going to hear some breaking, very hot news. So with that said, Tom, tell our listeners and our watchers a little bit about yourself. Let's start with, you know, uh, who you are, where you went to school, and how in heaven's name you came up with Real Self. Well, thank you again for having me. And I, I've known you for a long time, and I, I think this is a, is a fitting moment because this is our 14th anniversary uh, for Real Self. I started the company in a spare bedroom. It's fitting that I'm talking to you now from a spare bedroom. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so it is. <laughs> it's uh, uh, this time. It's not because I couldn't afford office space. It's um, I literally. Um, don't have an open office due to the pandemic. Uh, I, I, I'm a tech nerd, I guess, is what they would say in the old days. Um, that's now a badge of honor, but used to be sort of maybe a disparagement. I've always loved technology, and entrepreneurship is also some bug I've had from a long period. And real self is just a labor of love, and it started with an observation I made, and I can tell you that story, it is, if, if that's of interest, of how the, the seed of an idea I'd like to hear um, it. It's a great um, story. Go ahead. How did it? How did it happen? Yeah, I I was uh, working for what was a startup and became a pretty significant company called Expedia, which everybody's heard of. But when I joined it, my friends thought I was crazy. They're like, Expedia, what? I say, how do you spell that? And it was a poorly chosen word, I think. But it 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 worked. It it got branded. Um, and. What I was marveling about at Expedia was this company called TripAdvisor, which had just was amazing in the amount of information it provided to us as travelers to understand what we we're going to experience. You know, it really flattened the information asymmetry that existed between us and say what used to exist our travel agents and empowered us. And I loved it. And so did consumers. It was growing like a weed and um, it was very powerful. And um, I started thinking about that as a great business model and, and, and also value for consumers. And my just coincided as I was thinking about that and entrepreneurial ideas, my wife had gone to a clinic and um, she was um, getting a facial actually. And they had suggested she get a laser treatment and, and gave her a brochure about it. And when she came home, she said, you should look at this. And I said, what is it? She goes, it's this brochure for a $1,500 laser treatment, which astonished me at the time. I had no idea there was such a thing as burning your face off to look prettier, let alone for $1,500. <laughs> and she said something that was a light bulb moment, which is, you know, and I don't believe anything in here. And I said, what do you mean? And she goes, well, it, uh, it, it's uh, perfect results, this before and after, and it doesn't look like a, a person like me doesn't talk about my skin you know, type. And I, it says I'll be back to work in a day, and I just don't think that's going to be truthful at I, either. And for me, that remind me of what travel agents used to do when they gave you that brochure for Sandals Resorts or whatever place uh, they suggested to you and your loved one to go and take very precious, precious time and go on vacation, and then you get there and discover they're doing construction on the pool, you know, all, this, all the shenanigans that happen in travel that are were left out of the brochure mm-hmm. and so i started digging in and i looked online to well what is it like for a wife 
my wife to to go online and research this. Is there a trip advisor for face, body, and smile? And there were some there were some bulletin boards and stuff that were kind of kind of you know there are there there, were, there was some information, but not structured in a way that was super helpful. And I decided to jump in and dig in, and, and the more I discovered about my aesthetics and the, the the providers behind it, I just got sort of, um, I fell into the rabbit hole of, of interest and intrigue. And I always believed my hypothesis at the time of starting the company was, this someday will be a major category of consumption and consumer beha- uh, purchasing. I think this will trend in a way that has played out, you know, for practices like yourself, but also for the industry at large. Mm-hmm. And with that, you started Real Self. Yeah, and I, well, I started Vivid Self, and my cousin in New York who's in the media business said, um, you cannot call your company Vivid Self. And I said, why not? It's a great name. Here's why. And he said, everything with the name Vivid is in the porn industry. And I was like, what? Uh, you know, <laughs> totally naive. And he goes, you cannot use the word Vivid. I said, okay. And so I did a soul searching, did a bunch of research, and I found uh, Real Self. And it turns out a, a gentleman had written a book um, called like Explore the Real Self, and he owned realself.com. And I I said I'd buy it, uh, the domain, for I think it was like $300. And he said, oh, yeah, fine, take it. <laughs> so, so yeah, I started, and uh, and then I was really fortunate to have um, my CEO that I worked for at Expedia, Rich Barton, who is the uh, now the CEO and the founder of Zillow, and uh, he was the founder of Expedia. He he said, I'll, I love what you're doing and i i want to support it you know power to the people was his mantra and he really saw it as an interesting transparency play that really gave consumers more information and made them smarter and better customers for for folks like you Uh uh-huh and i got involved right at the very beginning 14 years ago and uh poor poor you you didn't know better that it was just me and my wife in a bedroom (laughs) and you were sending (laughs) out questions about lasers and i remember when you (laughs) sent me that very first question yeah, my, well, you know, there's something else you did that actually, um, I was, because I knew, I, I, pre- I prepare for these type of shows. Uh-oh. And uh, one thing I was digging around was, you know, the, one of the outreaches my wife was making, she was my only employee, um, unpaid, and uh, in the beginning, and we said, oh gosh, we need photos. And so we reached out to you. I have no idea how we got your email address. Um, I don't believe it was under nefarious re- ways, but... We wrote to you and your peers, and you were the only one who responded in a very favorable, positive, how can I help you? And I think that speaks, you know, this show is maybe a testament and a a capstone to your career, but there's something about you seeing ahead and the trends and and knowing, you know, what's being open. And I appreciate that, Grant. And you've been like that with me for, um, for, for, for the long haul and, I will be forever forever grateful. Thank you very much. And you've offered a real service to our patients and to industry alike. I mean, what you've created is an encyclopedic treatment of the various procedures we do, surgical and non-surgical, and given people a platform with which to communicate. And that's been an invaluable service. And I know you've gone through a lot of changes. Um, Tell me something. How has COVID affected you personally? Has it affected your your business, mm-hmm. real self? And what do you see uh, happening in my business, the the beauty business, if you will, or our business, the beauty business, as a result of COVID? Yeah, I think COVID's been tremendously challenging um, for people and all my team, uh, members of family, and it's been true hardship and a, a level playing field for all of us, even. Uh, you know, even the Jeff Bezos of the world have to face the consequences of of a pandemic and the risk factors associated with it. I'm really proud of the adjustments my team has made. Um, they've been incredibly um, quick and fleet-footed about adjusting to fully remote. And I'm also incredibly appreciative and, and have so much gratitude for the support my family's giving me and in particular my wife. Um, fortunately we've not had any direct health impacts, but boy, um, it has really, um, altered the way I think I see the world and, and changed my priorities and, and I think in a healthy way and, you know, maybe, maybe we all need to look for silver linings in these moments. 
And, you know, I have lunch with my kids every day now. Mm -hmm. I see them. I would normally be at a conference with you. Right. <laughs> you exactly. know, or somewhere. Uh, and while I love those meetings, um, I, and I was on the road all the time. And this has pulled me away from that and pushed me to be closer with my family and the, one, the ones who I really love deeply um so not to get all gushy but <laughs> that's it's it's just changed priorities in life and i think you've talked about that to me you know, i know you've talked to me about that how yes. you've had life events that have adjusted your you know understanding of what are the most important things and what are potentially not no question there is a silver lining to this silly covid pandemic although i can't wait till it's over oh um, yeah but there I'll are hug silver lines. Yeah, right. Please do. So, tell me about the business model. What's going on with your traffic? Uh, yeah, yeah. What's going on with real self traffic? Yeah, we've we we've, we've had an interesting periods of of um, challenges where Google has fallen in love with us, fallen out of love, and we you know we're not a hundred percent. You know, some people think we're a hundred percent Google. We have a huge base of consumers who come to us direct and a very very large email base our email systems are at least 15 to 20 percent of our everyday traffic but you know google's important for all of us and and, and still persists as a an important traffic source so um sitting here today we're i'm really excited to to talk about we're seeing really significant growth and performance improvements in that and some of it's real self-oriented but you know we're seeing about 40 to 50 percent year-over-year growth in traffic and i you know, maybe I would wager that it'll probably be closer to a hundred percent, um, closer to Q4. So wait, does that mean double? You're, you're saying a hundred percent, you mean you've doubled yeah, the traffic and yeah, I year? think we're going to be double, but, um, that's our internal sense of things. We think we're on the right side of the algorithm. Finally, uh -huh. you know, it's like on Instagram, sometimes you're on the wrong side of the algorithm and our team has to fight its way out of it. And, and it's a healthy, it's a healthy tension that I think exists in the technology space because ultimately algorithms um, are really not designed to penalize you. They're really designed to present to consumers the best experience. And that's what we focus on mm -hmm. real self. You know, how do we create the best possible experience? So that's, that's on the traffic front, higher conversion rates for sure. Uh, we're seeing, what do you mean by that? Conversion oh, to surgery? Oh, sorry, the pull through, like people mm -hmm. who are coming to the site are more inclined to reach out to doctors like yourself and, and we can talk about how that um, flows through into specific areas. But, um, you know, the pandemic has this interesting effect where um, it has shifted household budgets around. It's changed lifestyles and suddenly surgical considerations that were backburnered are being frontburnered. And I know you've seen that in your practice, but, um, you know, we see it too. And the good news is we see going forward, you know, we're sort of a leading indicator of where the industry is going mm -hmm. and it, it speaks well to many areas not all but most that surgeons particularly your peers really care about so <clears throat> could you let our viewers know about how much traffic you have on a monthly basis or daily basis can you give a, an idea to the consumers just yeah we don't publish we don't publicize that or publish our exact numbers but you know we reach um you know five five four to five million unique visitors a month on organic traffic alone mm -hmm. um we reach millions of people each month on platforms like instagram um so yeah we i believe the number that we calculate for last year was um um we we reached over 100 million consumers worldwide we have a very large presence in london um australia fast growing in India. It's really, I, I love the internet. I uh -huh. mean, there's parts of the internet I hate, don't get me wrong, but I do love that we have a global business, even though we're parked, most of us are parked here, up here in the Pacific Northwest in a tiny little space. So could you compare and contrast the, the interest in surgical versus non-surgical aesthetic procedures, both today and look back and look forward. So, you know, what was it 10 years ago? when you started or 14 years ago when you started and then where are you now and then what do you see in the future in terms of the relative searches for surgical versus non-surgical or conversions wow it's a interesting time frame um i i think one one, one survey 
uh, and I'm not trying to dodge your question, but I just want to point out to one thing that I found fascinating in a recent survey. And we survey our audience all the time, trying to get a pulse of where things are going. And we, we ask the same questions over and over and over for years and years and months and months and to look where things are changed. But one thing that has persisted since I started the company and for that 10-year period you cite um, is that this is still a very personal journey and decision a consumer makes, and they make it over long decision cycles it's not an instantaneous like wake up one day and say i i I want a new body or a new a new look it's a very considered purchase in other words Mm -hmm. and that hasn't changed of course and and that's healthy i think that's healthy that you don't have people just on a whim um deciding it and uh and so we saw in a recent survey that 51 percent of the audience still associate aesthetic procedures getting a procedure um as having social stigma associated to it. And I found that pretty interesting given, you know, what we see on Instagram, um, the level of sharing of content across all sorts of platforms has just dramatically changed. And what people used to keep private is so out there, right, with TikTok Mm -hmm. and others. So I think that that trend is something that's persisted over time. And it speaks, like I said, to um, to something that is integral to this is we, we should never forget we're in the space that it's highly personal and there's a lot of trust factors that are involved and consumers um, are using the internet to find pathways of trust to both what they end up doing and who they end up trusting their face, body and smile with. And as I have joked on the podium about, and I don't think I get a lot of laughs from your peers on this one, but I say, this is a, this is one area of purchasing that your return policies stink and the doctors are like, what? And I'm like, well, it's true. It, it, and, but that's real. Like consumers realize it's a pretty persistent, tr- you know, when they decide to do these things, it's not a real reverse, you know, it's a one-way door decision, in other words. Well, not so, always. Um, what's that? Not always. Yeah, there's, let's, there's uh, I think for the perception is it is. And, and, and it particularly, it's, it, if it's not because of your technique and, t- and talent, it's, it's, the time and money required to mm-hmm. go for it and the emotional energy you, you know better than i do you see the patients and the level of you know, what it, courage sometimes they have to muster to to make these decisions mm-hmm. and and to move forward and excitement i would say um so we're seeing um surgical interest um has stayed remarkably strong across certain spaces over time but in others i would say they've sort of um uh, you know, there have been flashes and and of 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 excitement, and then they kind of dissipate. So, what has persisted, and what's been interesting to look over ten years, and this is definitely uh, an incredibly important feedback loop for surgeons, board certified surgeons, is that consumers are entirely sat like you know amazingly satisfied. Um with surgical intervention in particular, the more um, challenging procedures like tummy tuck um, or breast augmentation or, or rhinoplasty. And, and so as a whole, as an industry, the, where we sit today 10 years later is the world is that your customers, your patients are saying, you know, they're really satisfied with the results and it's really positive. On the, on the, on the non-surgical side, it's a mixed bag. There's a, like I said, the flash pan, you know, flash moment, like this topic, you know, somebody's really excited about something and some injectable that blasts away fat in your belly. And, you know, these, these, these moments that you guys have all seen and sort of um, grimace and say, oh gosh, this is not good for the industry. And truly those things kind of are flash in the pan type of, of, of things. Um, but you cannot deny that the, the leading sort of driver to and, and point that people enter into aesthetics is clear in the toxin and filler space, but most, most pronounced with Botox Mm -hmm. and has enabled a, and that we see today is a, the dominant brand in the market and becomes uh, one that um, consumers most often associate to uh, the overall aesthetic space. You're saying the actual brand Botox, the actual brand for sure. So Botox is a, is a toxin, if you will. And there are at least five on the market right now. And Botox is the 800 pound gorilla and certainly the one that's most recognized and you and i were chatting beforehand about some of the factors that affect whether or not a person has botox and uh, could you share with us some of the statistics you've seen with your viewers in terms of what what they might be looking for in a in a toxin 
Yeah, I mean, without a doubt, um, it's not a price a price question that consumers are trying to solve for. They're they're really trying to figure out what's right for them. And their girlfriend, their friend has told them they've had Botox, so that's something that they want to learn more about and get answers to questions that you know you that are you know we have I don't know four million Q and A's at this point, and which is an indicator of there's not just a few questions on people's minds. There's um, unlimited number of questions, and 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 that makes sense. You know, Botox is is you know has some some elements of it that you know there's a tox part of that that sounds a little scary, right? Right. <laughs> um, the bow is okay. It's a tox side. That Toxin is scary. Of. And also, they've heard things and rumors and so forth. Um, so they go to validate or invalidate what they've heard and learned. And you know, Botox is um, has high satisfaction rates. Mm-hmm. Um, so do the other toxins. It's just like I said earlier, though, there really isn't any brand. Um, uh, I shouldn't say any. There's much less brand awareness according to the research we've done around Botox. So our traffic for Botox and, and interest in Botox is orders of magnitude higher than other toxins. You mentioned earlier that duration of, of the toxin, in other words, how long it lasts would affect consumer behavior. Well, you want to share that with us? Yeah, I, I sorry, you were, I, I apologize, you were asking for, well, what are consumers looking for? Mm-hmm. I think something that they aren't necessarily looking for because they don't know about it yet is higher duration. So we were just curious and we asked our audience of consumers who, and we have a, we ask, uh, routinely ask people who are already have committed to connecting to a practice like yours. Um, we asked them survey questions and we just slipped in once uh, this last period. Um, well, tell us what you know about, you know, what brands you know in the filler and toxin space, what's your awareness level. And we saw that the highest awareness and preference um, was for Botox, no surprise, like we were just talking about. So 35% of the audience said they preferred it um, over other options. But then we asked a subsequent question, if um, if that brand that you just cited lasted twice as long, um, would you switch? And they said 84% said yes. And so I think toxins that last longer uh, are delivering a really unique differentiate value proposition that lines up to what we hear in other surveys over and over again, that getting appointments is really hard. Uh, it's, I, the fewer, fewer times I have to come into a practice, the better, even though that goes against your interests and your peers. <laughs> um, it's, it's not easy. You know, if we're all busy and people are, and uh, you know, there's, it's getting, going to a doctor's office, whether it's for aesthetics or for you know, emergency care, is never really high on the list of things people want to spend time on, mm-hmm. particularly with COVID. Absolutely. It's particularly with COVID, people do not want to come in, and that's why we're doing so many virtual consultations. How is that affecting real self? Uh, are you doing virtual consultations or uh, with your clients or the customers in terms of real self? Yeah, I, it, there's been a lot of research or um, stories about how the pandemic has um shifted and accelerated trends that are already in place around digit the digital you know access to healthcare um, telehealth in ways that are are, are are incredible like the rate at which people like have shifted things in such a short amount of time and one thing that is remarkable is we facilitated um virtual consults with doctors and we, we decided to not build our own platform for virtual consults because I think doctors have lots of options and choices and we rather give you flexibility of what you want to do with your patients and overnight like literally within a, like a 10 to 15 day period 1500 doctors said I want to offer virtual consults and, and have that as an option on my on my on my uh, profile and real self mm-hmm. and we're seeing that consumers really like that option they still want to see you in person let's get that straight sure but they find it incredibly helpful to fit their lifestyle it's it the number one reason they would consider a virtual console is because it's easier on their schedule and time 
and they're just excited about it. So, um, and, and they're really satisfied when they do these virtual consults. So, um, again, uh, another feedback loop of satisfaction from the consumer side of things. We've certainly seen that in the marina in our offices that uh, the consumers are very happy with virtual consults. Of course, we have face-to-face -face consults before surgery, but we're doing a lot of virtual consults uh, with Real Self and then within our own practice with Zoom and uh, FaceTime and so forth. Do you like them? I mean, do you enjoy doing? You know, at first I didn't, but I've kind of grown to like them now. They're very efficient. We can schedule them on non-traditional hours, so uh, we do a lot of them in the evenings. Uh, we might do surgery in the morning. Uh, we're doing non-surgicals, uh, and we are we are seeing patients. Uh, um, we obviously screen them, and our pull through is not the same as it was in terms of yeah. the number of people per unit time. The number of people we can see in an hour is dramatically reduced because of the various things that we do in order to ensure the safety of our patients and our staff, um, and the screening and, and so forth. Uh, but I've grown to appreciate actual virtual consults, and I think we're not going to give them up. I think it's going to be the new reality going forward, which brings me actually to my next question with you. You've, <clears throat> so you've been around this industry now for 14 years, and I can remember when you first started, you were a babe in the woods. You, I don't even think you knew what a board-certified plastic surgeon was, and I can remember I sitting in not. a room talking to you about this at one of the Aesthetic Society meetings where um, – where we were educating you, if you will, of who should be and shouldn't be doing this, these surgeries. But you're now uh, in the mainstream and you've met thousands of surgeons and uh, across the specialty, the aesthetic specialty and what we call the core. Why don't you look over the mountain, if you will, and, and tell me what you see in the next five years and 10 years. What, what changes are we going to see based on what you've seen over the last 14 years? Give us a look. From yeah, Tom I, Series perspective, yeah, I don't know if I can weigh in on the the board certifi certified versus non, um, and and that's a, a space we can dig into if you want. But no, let's uh, a, let's go let's go forward. <laughs> yeah, what, what are we going to say? Let's leave that alone. Let's talk about the future. Uh, I actually, um, I think that it'll still remain. Going back to my earlier comments, I think it still will remain a very personal and private decision. I don't see a, a, a change um, where suddenly everybody's going to say, oh, where did you get your work done? You know, where are you going to get your work done? It's not going to be in that nature. In mm -hmm. fact, um, I think surgeons will have technologies and other methodologies to deliver results are even more and more um, sort of, uh, I don't want to say the word natural, but um, something that'd be harder for somebody to actually detect as uh, an intervention of any sort. Um, there'll be a lot more technology choices, but I think technology, since I am a techie type, um, or at least I, I like to be seen as one, um, I, I think technology is going to transform practice, to the patient practice interface. So what I mean by that is, in many ways, you have a consumer who is, in, is digitized. She is sitting on a phone that allows her, enables her to order you know, groceries that are going to show up in an hour. Um, everything's coming to her. She's the center of the universe. Um, uh, services, um, information. And as I mentioned earlier, reaching to a practice is so hard now. You can't, it's very, very infrequent. You can book it online. Um, your patient information is not necessarily easily accessible to you. Um, the, the exchange between the practice and the, the consumer is, is labored and difficult. And I, th I think, you know, as we saw from, in we're seeing from Instagram and others, as the dialogue is, and, and flow increases, business increases. So I think doctors will embrace more technology enablement so that the digital consumer and is interfaced with a digital practice, digital first practice, not a digital second or third, or maybe we should get some things into the digital world someday model. Um, so, um, it'll, it'll make practices look much more like one medical and other plays you see in healthcare, which are really empowering consumers with information and informatics and, um, and, and so that, that will play a role as will other things like AI and others will start answering some of the basic questions and provide you with some relief at the front desk. So you can handle more interfacing 
Um, so it becomes less laborious and everything's not just extra cost and, and pressure on you to figure out how to deal with yet another challenge of communication line or, or interface. Interesting. Well, it's certainly been wonderful interviewing you, Tom, and seeing you again. And I promised our viewers and our listeners uh, some breaking hot news uh, if they listen to the, the entire podcast. So I'm going to allow you now to make that announcement that you told me about and you shared with me. Why don't you go ahead and share with the world the latest and greatest for Tom, Siri, and Real Self? Yeah, I think 14, as I mentioned beginning the show, 14 years is the place where I am today. And, and, uh, it seems like the perfect moment for me to, um, to step aside in my role as CEO and become exec chair of real self and, and, uh, promote our chief operating officer to become our CEO. And for me, that's a, obviously as a founder as CEO, I, that's a, that's a big decision, but I'm building that decision around a proven individual, somebody I've worked with closely. His name's James Coyle. And he has incredible leadership um, talent. The team has really, um, he does most of the operations at Real Self already. And he is um, a true believer in what I set out in terms of my vision. And I'm not going anywhere. I, I Maybe to the chagrin of some of your listeners. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm not going anywhere. I, as exec chair, I am still, uh, will be significantly involved in the company. And uh, I love aesthetics. And uh, this industry has em embraced me and challenged me in ways that I can't let go of. So um, it, it really should not really, on the doctor front, be a big difference other than we strive to be a better and better platform and um, open to feedback and you know our, our orientation is should and will always be we want our uh, partner doctors and practices to simply be successful along with us and I think that's very feasible and possible no matter who is in the titled role CEO but um, so that's that's the news Grant okay. and I, I'm I, I'm you're the first one first place I'm I'm sharing it even before uh, you know our local local and business press so well i appreciate that very much tom and congratulations well, it's, you know, it's, it's, and i know you're not going anywhere yeah. i know i'll be seeing you <laughs> either virtually or live yeah. at the meetings we've been on stage a number of times together since that very first email yeah. that you sent me and it's been yeah, it's a, just wonderful, a new title for me and yep. uh and you know fewer direct reports i'll have more time for um sharing more insights that we have and data and and you know and and doing uh, my own, I have my own show called Hey Siri, which is a play on, of course, the app on Siri because they took my name. Uh huh. Um, That's right. And, and maybe yeah, you can well, go to some more Washington Husky football games and watch my Oregon Ducks crush the Washington Huskies. Yeah, I would just like there to be football. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. We can agree <laughs> on that. It. We don't have to agree on which team, but we can agree on missing college football. Okay, uh, well, thank you very, yeah. very much for spending this time with me and with all of our listeners. We really appreciate you, Tom, and Real Self and everything you've done. Also to support the beloved Aesthetic Society, um, the American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery. Thank you for all your support over the years and look forward to seeing you soon, Tom. Stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much for joining me on the Technology of Beauty, where we have the movers and shakers of the beauty business every other Tuesday. Take care. <laughs>